Thank you for joining us for today's BISI webinar. This webinar is being sponsored by the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, also known as SPISI, and has been organized by SPISI's Graduate Student Committee, which runs both a policy-focused webinar series and a methodology-focused webinar series. I'm Sarah Mancall, SPISI's Policy Director. I will now turn the webinar over to Megan George, a PhD student in Social and Personality Psychology at York University in Toronto. Megan will be serving as today's webinar facilitator. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to SPICI's first methodology webinar for the fall 2017 term. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from Caitlin Bentley. She is a Chancellor's Graduate Fellow and PhD candidate in the Department of so uh, Psychological and Brain Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Sarah, if you can go to the next slide for me, please. Uh, before I turn it over to Caitlin, I just want to give everyone a bit of background information about our organization. So if you joined us for our policy webinar last month, this should be a review, but for those of you who are new to the SPICI webinar series, or if you're new to SPICI in general, we'd like to welcome you to our community of over 3,000 scientists and researchers. SPICI members share a common interest in the psychological aspects of both social and policy issues. Since its founding in 1936, SPICI aims to bring theory and practice into focus on human problems of groups, communities, and nations, as well as issues that defy national boundaries. So although SPICI is an independent society, we do operate as Division 9 of the American Psychological Association and an organizational affiliate of the American Psychological Society. If any non-members are interested in the society, uh, SPICI welcomes new membership of anyone interested in joining. So please check out our website shown on your screen there. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll see um, some, I want to draw your attention to some of the many opportunities that SPICI offers. So in addition to offering an intellectual home, networking opportunities, conferences, awards, and fellowships, we also have a peer mentoring program, both a policy and methodology webinar series, different writing opportunities uh, within our graduate student newsletter called The Rookie. And all of these aim to support graduate students in their scholarly and policy related pursuits. So don't forget to check out all of our social media platforms for information. And this includes our website, our Facebook page, and our Twitter page. Um, so with respect to the procedure for today's webinar, to avoid no noise interference, all attendees will be vocally muted throughout the webinar. But as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, we know that there will be questions and comments. So we ask that you use the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen to pose these questions. I will be monitoring the chat portion, and I'll collect all of the questions throughout the presentation, and I'll pose those questions to Caitlin at the end of the presentation. So lastly, both the slides and the talk will be available shortly after the webinar, both via SPICI's website and our YouTube channel. We'll post the digital versions uh, to our Facebook pages and Twitter feeds once they're available, so keep an eye out uh, if you're interested in these. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so as I mentioned, Caitlin Bentley is a Chancellor's Graduate Fellow and PhD candidate in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. She is a third year um, student in the Emotion and Relationships Lab run by her advisor, Dr. Tammy English. Caitlin received her Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences and Psychology from Carnegie Mellon University. And she received her MA in Psychological and Brain Sciences from Washington University. Her research examines how we experience and express emotion across various social contexts and relationships. Specifically, she's interested in the expression of nonverbal behavior when employing different emotion regulation strategies, such as distraction, masking, or suppression. She's also interested in the evaluation of off-color racial humor and how the race of the viewer, comedian, and the group being targeted interact to shape how funny and offensive we find jokes to be. Today, Caitlin will be sharing some of her expertise on behavioral coding techniques. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker. Welcome, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome, everyone. Today's talk is going to be looking at nonverbal behavioral coding. I'm going to be discussing it kind of from the, the perspective of where my research interests are. So primarily emotion and emotion regulation and looking at things like body language and facial expression, but also want to kind of encompass other forms of research. So 
um, if there are any areas that I don't talk about in the presentation, please feel free to ask a question about it later so that I can discuss it. Uh, next slide, please. So the overview of my talk is going to cover four main topics. First, what is nonverbal behavioral coding and why is it useful? Next, I'll go into how do we really decide what we're going to code in the study. And then I'll go into tips for data collection and tips for data analysis. So the first part I'll talk about here is going to be what is nonverbal behavioral coding. So when you think of nonverbal behavior, oftentimes people will think of facial expressions or body language. And really, it's going to be anything that's outside of verbal context. So it can include things like facial expressions and body language. But it can also include things like um, vocal prosody as well, so like the tone of your voice. And all of these things, these different channels, help us communicate what we're feeling internally to those around us, either to um, express what we're feeling or for other people to pick up on what we're experiencing inside. Next slide, please. So we use nonverbal behavior to convey social signals via visual and vocal channels. So those visual channels would include facial expressions and body language, and vocal channels would be more like vocal prosody. And again, that's going to be things like the intensity of one's voice or tone of one's voice. And I'm a little biased in saying it, but nonverbal behavior is really pretty cool because it just provides a lot of information about what's going on inside a person's head. So there could be a discrepancy between what someone is saying and what someone's showing or the things that we're saying and showing may coincide and kind of help amplify the expression of what we're feeling. Um, you can also study nonverbal behavior at an individual, dyadic, or group level. So you can look at nonverbal behavior from the context of someone sitting alone in a room, maybe watching something on a screen and responding to it. Um, you can also look and see how nonverbal behavior occurs in situations where you're interacting with another person, so um, the dyadic context or the group level where there are multiple people in the situation. Nonverbal behavior is also pretty cool because it's really applicable to a wide area of research interests and topics. And so before I go into kind of what those areas and topics could be, I'll first describe a little bit of my research interests. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of my research interests to kind of give you some context of what I study. So the first area of my research looks at nonverbal um, non behavior and emotion regulation. So specifically, when we're regulating our emotions using expressive suppression, do we use body language to communicate how we feel? So expressive suppression essentially masks what's going on on our face. So um, that's what you think of when you're trying to maintain a neutral appearance. But maybe something like your arm movements or your torso movements might convey how you're internally feeling. So in this line of research, I mainly look at facial expressions and body language. A lot of times, I'll look at it in a dyadic context. So with romantic couples often, maybe if they're arguing over something like, say, I don't know, maybe like in-laws or finances. If um, one person is kind of feeling really heated in the conversation, they might be more willing to show that emotion through their body language if they're trying to keep a neutral face during the interaction. And the big thing that we do here is to really compare what suppressors are doing versus they're not suppressing partners. So there could be things like maybe the non-suppressing partner starts mimicking the suppressor, or maybe they're compensating for the lack of input from the suppressing partner. So this is my first area of research. So over the course of my first year and second year, most of my research has kind of focused on this particular topic. Next slide, please. The second area of research that I've gotten into more recently has been looking at humor in the context of nonverbal behavior. So my primary research question is looking at what factors predict enjoyment of off-color racial humor, and also looking to see how things like the participant and comedian race could moderate these outcomes. So for example, is it more appropriate for one person to target a racial group than another, or are there other factors that are kind of predicting how people respond to this kind of humor? In this context, a lot of times I mainly look at facial expression, and a lot of times it's in an individual context. So typically we'll have someone Viewing a, um, oh, sorry, the slide just didn't my there. Anyway, typically we'll have someone viewing a, um, a comedy clip, for example, responding to it, and then um, deciding whether or not they find it appropriate, funny or offensive, et cetera. Um, sorry, just to check. Are the slides coming back? I figure it'll probably be easier for me to go through with the slides then. Um, 
Hi, is, um, are the slides, oh, sorry. Okay, now it should be working. Is it working, Katie? Um, not on my end. At least I have the slides for my own set. I just wasn't sure if everyone else was able to view it. Megan, how about you? I can see the specific methodology webinar. Uh, I think this is your opening slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, very strange. Okay, hold on one moment. Because I have, um, let's see. Which that slide like do you see now? The uh, still, the, still the, fr the first slide? Yes, and I think this is the one that you prepared. Huh. Um, that is very strange. Let me try closing out of my PowerPoint and then reopening it. What do you see now? It's still the same slide. Does it look like it's scrolling through? Nope. Um, I think what I'm going to do is pass the controls to you if I can. Um, would I be able to make you the presenter? And you could download the app and run the slides on your computer? Are you talking to me or to Caitlin? Either or. Um, Probably Caitlin would be best since the slides are mostly hers. Sure. Um, yeah, I haven't really used Meeting Burger before, but as long as it's pretty straightforward, that should be fine. Yeah, so I will walk you through it. Oops. Um, so basically, sorry about this, everyone. I'm going to <laughs> pause sharing. <laughs> um, and I am going to make you the presenter. Let me just find you here. Okay, and you should see something come up on your screen that asks you to download the app. Okay. Okay, I think it's loading up. It might take a minute. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Let me just pull up the slides. Okay. Perfect. I see them. Are you guys able to see my screen? Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, let me just skip to the other way. And if you can move your chat box or your host, mm -hmm. your that little box off to the side a bit. Perfect. Okay. Let me just move it down here if possible. All right. Is that better? Thank you everyone for being patient. <laughs> I'll leave you to it. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, for this area of research, we're really looking at facial expressions in an individual context. So for example, if we show someone a clip of a comedy routine, um, looking to see how they respond. And I'm hoping to expand this into more dyadic context and see maybe if there's some sort of audience or group effects that happen when we have two people or more watch the clip together. Um, so the biggest thing that I'm looking at here is comparing emotion experience and expression while viewing the comedy clips to kind of see if there are discrepancies between what people are reporting that they're feeling versus what they're showing, and kind of looking to see how this might shape whether they consider something to be funny or offensive. There we go. Okay. So beyond uh, emotion, there really are a lot of different areas that apply to nonverbal non behavior can apply to, I should say. Um, that includes everything from cognitive processing, mind wandering and attention, intergroup dynamics and status, implicit and explicit bias, 
relationship formation, social anxiety, consumer panels, product testing, therapy and counseling, linguistics, education, deception. Really, you can kind of almost apply nonverbal behavior to pretty much any situation. It's pretty great that way. The downside is it kind of makes it a little hard to narrow down how to actually run a study that's looking at nonverbal behavior. So the goal of this particular talk is to kind of condense it a little bit. So for someone who may or may not have that much experience with looking at nonverbal behavior, how do you actually go about designing a study and carrying out that project? So if you have decided that you're going to do a study involving nonverbal behavior, there are a few things that you have to figure out first. What behavior are you interested in? So for example, is it something that, and again, to tie it back to emotion, is it something like maybe facial expressions versus body language? Maybe it's looking to see if people who are um, not paying attention to your task, maybe it's fidgeting. Depending on what your research questions are, you can then narrow down what behaviors you're going to be coding. The next thing you'll want to look at is what settings you're going to be observing or testing the behavior in. So for example, is it going to be one person sitting alone, maybe doing some tasks on a computer? Is it going to be in a dyadic context where people are having a conversation? You kind of have to have a sense of where that situation is going to be occurring so you can figure out how you're actually going to be capturing those behaviors. Uh, next, you'll want to think about how do you want to analyze the behavior? So is it going to be something like any time they show positive emotion, regardless of what that means, are you going to code it more broadly? Or will it be more specific? So something like every time their arm moves to the left, that's going to be its own code versus when their arm moves to the right. And you could even break that down between the left arm and the right arm if it's relevant to your research question. And then finally, you want to develop a timeline for each phase of the study. So doing a nonverbal behavior project from scratch can take a long time, especially if you're narrowing down what behaviors to pick, training coders, running the data, then analyzing it. You want to have a sense of how long each of those stages is going to take, so that way you're not doing a project for years. So out of personal experience, my first year project ended up taking about two years. Finally finished, we're still in the process of writing up, which who knows what will happen with that one day. But it really can take a long time to go through each of the steps of the process. So you'll want to keep that in mind, especially if the other components of the study are already going to take a long time. Sometimes it's easier to have just nonverbal behavioral coding in like one study as opposed to that on top of other projects or other requirements in a project. Okay, so the next item I'm going to go into is deciding what behaviors you're going to code. So as I've kind of described before, there are lots of different behaviors you could code. For facial expressions, it could be something like specific emotions. So if the face looks like they're showing happiness, sadness, excitement, whatever it might be, you could code based off of that. Or you could code more specifically and look at muscle movements. So for example, if a particular muscle that shows smiling moves, so the zygomatic major, maybe that's what you want to be coding. You could also look at body language in sort of a um, more specific way too. So for example, posture movement for head, torso, arms, and legs. Uh, you can look at gaze and eye contact. If someone's gesturing or fidgeting, and gesturing might be arms and hand, hand movement. Fidgeting might be any sort of body movement, from leg movement to hand movement to head movement that indicates maybe they're feeling anxious or not paying attention. Uh, you could also look at vocal prosody, so things like the intonation, tone, stress, and rhythm of someone's voice. And you can also look at other behaviors, including like touch and interpersonal distance if someone's interacting with another person. There are other behaviors that you can code beyond these. These are the ones I'm kind of more familiar with. Uh, the vocal ones, not as much. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to really do any studies yet looking at vocal prosody, but I'm hoping to at some point. So when you are picking behaviors, a lot of times there are coding schemes that are already preset. And examples of published coding schemes include things like the facial action coding system, which is probably one of the most popular ones, that breaks down facial expressions and movements into specific muscle movements. Um, there's also the body action and posturing, posture coding system, which breaks down basically different types of body language from arm movement to torso movement. Um, there is the annotation scheme for conversational gestures, and that, as it's said in the name, really focuses on gestures. Um, there's also things like the specific affect coding system, which includes a combination of body language and vocal content to show 
when couples are communicating with each other, are they showing something like validation or belligerence? Um, so these are just a very small subset of various coding schemes you could use. But really, there are a lot of different ones out there. And oftentimes, depending on what behaviors you're interested in, there's probably going to be a coding scheme that will fit perfectly with your research question. There are also some benefits to using a published coding scheme. So some of the pros include having a predetermined list of behaviors to work with. So you don't really have to go through and figure out from scratch, OK, what parts of the body am I going to look at, and how much detail do I have to figure it out? That part's already been done for you, which is pretty great. Um, you might even discover relevant behaviors that you hadn't considered studying. So for example, if you're looking at maybe fidgeting, maybe you've been focusing on arm movements that you notice, oh, if someone's kind of tapping their foot, that might also indicate fidgeting. And based on this coding scheme, I should include that too. Um, there's also validation through prior testing. So oftentimes, these coding schemes are well established and have uh, backgrounds showing that they really do indeed capture what they're trying to capture. And finally, writing a manuscript about a well-known coding scheme is often much easier than trying to write one from scratch. So oftentimes, it'll be something like, we use the following coding system citation, and then you can pretty much go straight into the rest of your methods. Oftentimes, it's something where you can refer to the original manuscript if you need more detail beyond that. There isn't really a lot that's required of it. Although like most things, there are some cons to using a published coding scheme. So not all of the behaviors that are on the coding scheme may be relevant to your research. So for example, if you were looking at fidgeting, you were focused on arm movement, but there's a table in the middle of the conversation or where the people are interacting, leg movement doesn't really matter at that point. So it's not really useful to have an entire section of leg movement codes to be looking at. Some coding schemes also only work in certain contexts or had minimal testing in other situations. So for example, um, the SPAS codes, the specific action coding system, is set up for couples. So you could potentially use it for something like maybe roommates or siblings arguing. But there are some codes that are really focused on more rela romantic relationship contexts and not really platonic relationships. So not all coding schemes are going to translate easily to all kinds of research questions. Uh, some behaviors don't have a well-established coding scheme. So, I haven't really come across any for leg movement. If any of you are inspired to go develop a coding scheme after this talk, please come see me, because like, there are a bunch of behaviors that still don't really have coding schemes. Um, sometimes those coding schemes will be in other research areas. So a lot of my stuff is like social and personality psychology. But sometimes it might be in like, um, like machine learning or machine interaction. Um, maybe it's in cognitive psychology. Maybe even it's not even in a psychology-related area. It kind of varies depending on where, um, what means or what um, journal published the article. But oftentimes, it's kind of difficult to find some of these coding schemes. And for a lot of behaviors, they just don't really exist. And finally, it might re require some time consuming or costly training. So you may have to pay either for the training materials or certification. Um, very rarely are these coding schemes like um, behind a paywall. Oftentimes, it's as long as it's been published and you have access to the article, you can then go forth and use the coding scheme. But there are certain ones that do require you to pay to become, for example, like the facial action coding system, SAC certified. So you could use it as someone who isn't but certified. But oftentimes, if you're publishing, reviewers will want to see someone who's formally certified using that coding scheme. So depending on which one you're picking, that might be one issue to consider. So let's say there really isn't a coding scheme that works for you. And there's always the option of making a do-it-yourself coding scheme. So the nice part is you have full control over what behaviors you're going to be coding. It's really useful for those understudied behaviors that don't really have a good coding scheme out there. Um, you can also use portions of published coding schemes as needed. So if you decide these three coding schemes have aspects that I want in mind, you can combine them into one that fits your project. The biggest thing is you'll want to keep track of where you're taking those codes from because you will have to talk about it later in your final manuscript or um, whatever else you might be using the coding scheme for. So another benefit of the do-it-yourself coding scheme method is that it could lead to the creation of another coding scheme. So if you end up creating one, using it across several studies, and it works really well, you could then make it almost like a formal coding scheme and publish an article that's kind of just, uh, describing like the reliability and validity of your coding schemes. 
And the final bonus, it's free training. So if you create it, you get to train people. You don't have to worry about paying for the training materials, certification, none of that stuff. It's all on you. Some of the downsides to doing a do-it-yourself coding scheme include um, sort of the difficulty of just creating something from scratch. There's a lot of articles out there, and really you could be searching kind of forever for the right article or the right types of codes for a certain behavior if there's not really much to go on. Um, there's also that issue of lack of extensive validation. So even though you've designed a coding scheme for this one study, it really might not be doing what you need it to do. And kind of going into the points underneath, you may be coding too little or too much. It might be the case that until, not until after you finish the study, you've realized, oh, I should have coded this, or we really should have been looking at this behavior in this context. And sometimes it's hard to tell before running the actual study what that's going to look like. And finally, a manuscript featuring the coding scheme is probably going to have a very lengthy method, method section. So oftentimes you will have to describe, we've taken these different behaviors from these previous studies, we then added this stuff, here's why, and you almost have to justify a lot more why you designed the coding scheme you did and how you did it in comparison to the one that's preset. So in summary, when you select a coding scheme, you have to consider what behaviors you're going to examine and in how much detail. You'll have to weigh the pros and cons between different coding scheme options. And you'll also have to pay attention to the changes that you're going to be making when to establish coding schemes and report them whenever you do disseminate your project. So I added a brief question break just in case there were any questions targeting sort of the first half of the talk. Um, Megan, are there any questions that I should probably address now before continuing on? No, I think we're good, but I just do want to remind participants um, there's no need to save your questions until the end. So if you do have any questions as we're going through the slides, feel free to type them into the chat section, and I will compile them and uh, address them at the end. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and just continue on then. So the next part that we'll be talking about is tips for data collection. So now that you've figured out what you're going to be coding, how do we go about actually collecting that data? So the first set of issues I want to talk about are study-related issues. So first, how will you collect the nonverbal data? So most times now, especially since it's so much easier to record things like with your phone, webcams, uh, cameras installed on the walls, whatever it might be, Recording nonverbal behavior is really always preferable over just conducting a live observation where you mark off times where someone's doing a behavior. Um, as you guys probably can already assume, it's, it's easy to miss things, especially if you're doing it live during an interaction. And having the recording means you can go back over it at a later date. You can have people check over other people's coding. It's just much easier and simpler to record the behaviors rather than recording it live or marking it off live like on a sheet of paper or something like that. Uh, you'll also want to keep in mind where the study is going to be taking place. Hopefully it's somewhere quiet and has good lighting. Um, oftentimes if there's ambient noise, sometimes that can be picked up by the camera. Lighting can be an issue sometimes, especially if you're doing facial coding. Um, and even like the distance of the camera and the person sometimes can be an issue too. And one of the other items you want to consider is what the room layout will look like. So for example, will there be a table in the room? Will there be chairs? Is it okay if the person tilts their chair? Like can the camera still capture their face or body or whatever you might be coding? Um, sometimes we'll use things like tape and mark off places in the room just to keep track of where we have had the chair and where the kind of boundaries of the chair should be in relation to the camera. Another thing to consider is how long the session is going to be. So you'll want to know when you're going to be turning cameras on and off and if this requires doing that multiple cameras at one time. You also want to make sure that your recording equipment can handle collecting data for however long the session might be. Worst thing to happen, and I admit this has happened to me a couple times, is to turn on the video cameras and then record, and then it's uh, at the point where 20 minutes is too long for it to record, and it just automatically shuts off. You'll want to make sure that it's able to record whatever you need it to, and you'll also want to have a sense of where specifically in the study you need to turn the cameras on and off to make sure that you get exactly what you want to for the session. You'll also want to figure out how many experimenters you need. So really that's going to be enough people for session-related tasks and for controlling the recording equipment. 
really that might be one person. So for example, if it's like in our studies, we often have an RA um, run the session and say, well, I'll be right back. They go turn on the camera, they come back, they do the spiel, you're going to talk for five minutes, and then it's over and done with. Um, other times, you might need the experimenter in the room with them. And in that case, you're probably going to need another person controlling the camera. Or if you do something like, for example, we sometimes do the true social stress test, where someone comes in and has to do a stressful interview in front of three panelists. The three panelists have to be preceded in the room, and so we have to have another experimenter controlling the camera. The final point is that I want to make here is that you should ensure that all the experimenters are very comfortable using recording equipment. Um, there may be cases where someone has to switch out. Maybe the person who's supposed to be a panelist or in the room with the person is somehow unable to do that. You want to make sure everyone on your research team involved with the project knows the ins and outs of how to set up the recording equipment just to avoid any issues that might arise. So next thing I'll we'll talk about are filming related issues. So one thing that you'll need to keep in mind is how many people will be recorded simultaneously. So things like the angle of the camera, how far the cameras are, and will they be able to capture everyone in the situation that you're recording. You'll also want to think about how many cameras are needed. Should they be visible? Will you have to move them? And really, if the setup isn't ideal, feel free to experiment with different options. So my lab has um, wall-mounted cameras that are pretty obvious. We didn't cover them up. But sometimes they're kind of blurry, especially when they're recording from a distance. So we try to start using webcams. And so far, they've been a really great alternative. The downside is they're not great for group or dyadic interactions. Really, they're only good when it's an individual person in front of a computer screen. But using a widescreen or HD camera, like a webcam, for example, can really help improve video quality. So there may be ways that you can incorporate that into your study if it's better than the current camera setup that you have. Um, you could also use room decor to help conceal the cameras. Um, kind of a funny side note, so one of the labs that I used to work in, the PI was very, um, very insistent that we cover up the cameras. And really, it was kind of cool because she used a lot of um, furniture, plants, things like that to help sort of make them less obvious. And it really looked very realistic. The only downside is every so often we would have that one person who would notice the glint of the camera and be like, whoa, I'm on camera? What, what is going on? So you do kind of have that issue of if the room decor is really well set up, then it's probably not a problem. If it's a little too well set up to the point where someone notices halfway through the session that they're being recorded, that might get a little weird. So uh, in my current lab, we just have it set up where they're very obvious. And oftentimes, people who see them, they kind of just forget they're there or really just ignore them because they're so obvious to notice. So it really depends on your research question how much you want people to pay attention to the fact that they're on camera. And then finally, for face tracking, um, if someone's moving, you may want to consider that you might need to move the camera with them during the actual recording session. And if you are, you kind of want to practice doing that to make sure that the camera can fit um, any sort of frame or, I guess, be able to track wherever you need it to go, um, make sure that the people who are running the session are able to do that, and kind of, again, keep in, keep in mind like how much of the screen is going to be taken up by that camera. So, if you need to sort of have a boundary for where the chairs and tables and whatnot are to make sure that they are, if they do move, that you are, a sorry, <laughs> sorry, that you are able to capture it. You want to just make sure that you're good to go in that case. Additional questions that you'll want to think about are what participants are going to be doing during filming. So you want to pay attention to the study tasks that they're doing in case it affects nonverbal behavior. So if they're reading a sheet of paper, maybe the paper's on the table and they're bending down and forward you might not really be able to capture much. Um, or if they're doing a task that requires them to stand, you'll want to keep in mind that the codes that you're using are from someone who's standing, not sitting. You'll also want to note anything that might make coding difficult. So an example that I mentioned earlier, uh, like if you have a table in the way, you can't really look at leg movement as easily. So you may want to consider either removing the table if leg movement is really crucial to your research questions, or just scrap that from your coding scheme if you're not able to capture that movement. And finally, uh, sound. So if you're looking at vocal cues, you're going to need sound. If you're not, it's still really useful to have sound because you can still establish coding start and stop times. So later, we'll talk about how to do data analysis. One of the easiest things to do is set a time where, I don't know, maybe the experimenter closes a door or says, you may now begin. 
And at that point, that's where you want to start coding. It's much easier to have sound to establish that coding start time across all of your coders to make things easier for you for analysis so that all the videos align. You'll also want to make sure these microphones that you use are able to pick up whatever sounds that you're trying to capture from where the participants located. So if you have a camera that's on a wall, you'll want to make sure that it can still capture the sound from someone who's sitting at the other side of the room if that's the primary camera you're going to be using. Or you may want to consider adding a camera or microphone or something closer to the participants so that you can have both sources of information when you're collecting data. So in summary, when you're thinking about data collection, make sure to consider the setting for your collecting that data. Think about the recording equipment and the way that it's set up to make sure that it's optimal for your project. And definitely make sure to test your setup before running actual participants. I really recommend that if you are having multiple people run study sessions, try to have them be a participant and an experimenter at one time, just so they know where the cameras are, where the cameras can be seen from, um, what it's like to be a participant, and if the cameras seem obvious. All of those questions and troubleshooting issues oftentimes comes up through practice, and really it's just beneficial for everyone to have as much practice as possible before collecting actual data. All right. So now I'm going to go on to my last item. So this is going to be tips for data analysis. So training coders. Um, at, a minimum, at a minimum, you'll need at least two coders for each behavior. The primary coder is going to be that person that analyzes all of your videos for that particular behavior. So I do recommend having backup coders if possible. Oftentimes we'll have uh, research assistants, sometimes undergraduates in the lab, and if there is a high turnover rate in your lab, you'll want to keep in mind how long it takes to do this behavioral coding, and maybe have two people do the primary coding just in case someone is unable to continue in the lab, gets drawn away for another project. Whatever happens, you'll have some set of data. Um, but one thing I do want to mention as well is you want to avoid staggering primary coders within a behavior. Um, so you don't really want to have one person do half, one person do another half, and then call it the full set of data analyzed by two people. Ideally, you'll want to have one person analyze all of it. But there are cases where that's really just not feasible. And if so, you do kind of want to consider if you're staggering kind of how to do it so that um, you're able to collect and analyze, or I should say, analyze the data that you need to. You'll also need to have a secondary coder or reliability coder that will complete a subset of the videos. Often 15, 25% is a typical number. Most of the time in my lab, we aim for about 20 or so. And this person's going to do the reliability coding. So typically, that's going to be out of the randomized set of videos that someone's analyzing, the top, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30, depending on how many videos you have. Um, so they'll just code that one subset of videos, and you'll then compare the primary and secondary coders' reliability, um, or I guess coding progress to establish reliability. You can also assign people to do multiple coding duties. So if you have a bunch of people available to do coding, feel free to assign them to different behaviors, or you could assign someone to three behaviors, depending on how long the behavior coding takes and how much progress they're making, and also really if they're willing to do it, you can have them coding different behaviors as you need to. It doesn't have to be that you have to have a different primary and secondary coder for every single behavior you're looking at. Uh, for establishing reliability, you'll want to use group and individualized training sessions with practice videos to teach your coding scheme. So this will most likely happen sometime during that study design, maybe early on in data collection point. But you'll want to go through and help train people on a group and an individualized level so that they know exactly what they're supposed to be coding when you have them start actually doing the real set of videos. And you want to make sure to test reliability early and often. So oftentimes we'll use kappa as a reliability statistic. And if you're using that, you want to aim for that 0.65 as an absolute minimum. Um, ideally, you'll want to get closer to 0 0.7, 0 0.8, maybe even 0 0.9. Anything above 0.9 tends to be a little fuzzy just because that's kind of too perfect in a way. If you get a reliability of 1, which is technically possible, that would be very weird. But it depends on the behavior. If it's something like touch, it's really hard to mix up when someone is touching or not touching someone. So you're probably going to have a higher reliability statistic. If it's something like maybe torso movement towards or away a person, that can be a lot harder to distinguish, and there probably is going to be more variability across coders. 
but you'll want to make sure that your primary and secondary coder have good reliability before they start on the actual data set. So you want to make sure you calculate reliability for individual behaviors as needed and provide feedback to all coders. And the feedback you provide should be something along the lines of make sure to keep an eye out for, I don't know, torso movements, for example, as opposed to at 2 minutes and 10 seconds, you miss this one. At 3 minutes and 4 seconds, you miss this one. You don't want to get that specific. It's much better to have sort of a broad overarching keep an eye out for this, or you tend to overcode XYZ as opposed to giving them very specific details because you want them to go back and be unbiased as they go through, but have a sense of what they really need to be looking for. You could just tell them to go back and redo the videos, but oftentimes because of that time crunch of like having to continue the project, it can take a lot longer for people to figure out what they need to do to fix their reliability if you're not giving them any sort of hint or clue at what they should be doing. Okay, last item is going to be analyzing your data. So um, manual coding tends to be the most effective option, but it does take a long time. It requires at least two coders for each behavior, and um, really this is going to be something like you sitting in front of a computer and clicking on sets and offsets whenever someone moves their arm, someone smiles, whatever the behavior might be. The software that I've come across most frequently for this particular kind of coding is Moldus's Exerver XT. Um, I think there are other there are other softwares or programs that um, would probably work very well. This one's just the one that I come across most often in like psychology research. Um, for automated coding, that one's become more of a popular uh, popular option. It's still kind of in development though, so it tends to be very convenient, but it does have some issues with obstruction and can be expensive. So obstruction in this case could be something like maybe the lighting isn't good enough for the video. Maybe it's too fuzzy because the camera is far away so it's not very high definition. Um, maybe someone blocks their face because they put their hand in front of their eye or nose. Sometimes automated coding isn't always able to capture those nitty-gritty details that manual coding can. And oftentimes automated coding tends to be more expensive. Um, so there is one particular software um, interface that's in the list below that was recently released that's free for researchers. I haven't really been able to get it to work. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it just requires a lot of computing power, but hopefully, fingers crossed, over the next couple months I can figure something out. But that might be a really good option, especially if it's free and you can then use it in conjunction with manual coding. Um, but oftentimes, most coding softwares tend to be pretty expensive. Base Reader, um, Microsoft's API, oftentimes you do have to pay some amount to be able to subscribe to it or receive the program from the company. Um, there are other types of software. These are the ones that I've just come across most commonly. Um, and one other item I should mention too is if you are doing the automated coding, you want to just make sure that you do manual coding to establish reliability. So because it is a new and upcoming thing, oftentimes you can't really publish anything and just say we just did automatic coding, we didn't do any manual coding at all. Typically, you'll have to do reliability with manual coding. So in summary, when you're trying to prepare your data for analysis, make sure you decide what method you're going to use and software that you'll use for this process. Make sure to train your coders and establish reliability early on. Uh, you'll want to report your coding information and reliability statistics when preparing your data for publication. All right, so some final thoughts before we wrap up the presentation. Um, Nonverbal behavior really does provide some great insight into our internal states. It can be applied to many research areas, and overall is just kind of a cool tool to use in your research. And when you're designing a study involving nonverbal behavior, you want to keep in mind things like how you're going to measure the behavior you're interested in. You want to tailor the study settings to whatever your needs are. Develop an analysis plan with your research team early on. Practice running sessions before you collect real data. And make sure you keep a note of all study-related details, things you change, um, your reliability statistics, all the nitty-gritty stuff, so that if you do need to report it later on, you can refer to your notes um, and also be able to replicate studies that way, too. Cool. So thank you all for attending. And I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. OK, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and really relevant, I think, for a lot of people uh, attending this webinar series. Um, and you know it was interesting because we do have a number of questions from the attendees. Uh, 
So cool. I'm going to start with a question from Dante. Um, and the question is, have you ever experienced that the data drive the decision on which coding scheme you use? Ooh, that's a really good question. So yes and no. I think when I first started, because I didn't really know what to code for, the data definitely drove how I was thinking about what behaviors I wanted to code. So for example, my very first study was with a married couple, conflict interaction, so it was two partners, one person was assigned to suppress, and I just was able to code whatever I wanted to code. Really, it was to see what behaviors might differ between the partners. So initially, I was thinking maybe the body language thing, but then we had to figure out based on the room, the way that we had the room set up, what behaviors could I code? And so in that case, I started out really looking at the videos and trying to think, okay, based on the still frame of two people sitting in a room with a table, what could I feasibly code? Sadly, a lot of those codes really did not pan out. So I think now that I've had more experience doing the studies, I've tried to focus more on theory and what people have been using in established coding schemes to then figure out what I want to code. But I think it kind of depends both on how, how often you code that behavior or use that situation in your research. Um, but I think both both options are fine. It might just depend on kind of what's available for the coding scheme and how familiar you are with running that kind of study or that kind of context. Right. So you're sort of looking at it from a practicality uh, standpoint as well as the theoretical. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Great. Um, and so speaking of sort of the practicality, um, you mentioned sort of when you're setting things up and getting ready to run and record your uh, sessions. Uh, Dante mm -hmm. asks, uh, do you typically run uh, like an end-to-end -end pilot test before you begin your data capture with participants, uh, basically so, a test run? Yes. So if possible, I would say at least once, maybe a couple times, run an entire study session from start to finish, pretending that the person was an actual participant. Um, sometimes what I like to do is after I've run a couple sessions with um, the undergraduate research assistants in my lab, I then have the joy of pretending to be like an obnoxious participant where maybe I'm not sitting in the right position, maybe I'm leaning forward, and kind of give them a little bit of a challenge to troubleshoot all those things that could happen. Um, but I really do recommend at least once or twice running an entire session, and then the bonus of having someone be that obnoxious participant. Sometimes that can be really helpful just to help them feel calm about whatever might be going on, and also to figure out how to fix it if it does happen in a real session. Right. Great. Um, so our next question comes from Matthew, um, and this is asking about a specific, uh, sorry, a specific um, type of coding. So, do you have any tips mm -hmm. to help people um, who are doing like mental training with athletes? So, I assume this is more of sort of a natural observational setting. How do you code mm -hmm. for things that you have less control over? Ooh, that's a really good question. So I haven't really done that myself, but I think let's see. I guess that might be a situation where you do end up almost having to rely on live observations. And depending on the context, you may not be able to record what's going on. But that might be something where having some sort of preset either, I guess it would be almost like a, a sheet of notes or some sort of preset, maybe Excel sheet, for example, where you can essentially mark off things that you're going to be coding for as they occur. So that way you don't have to be like, writing almost longhand notes of what's happening. You could maybe be just checking a box if you see certain kinds of behaviors. For the first few rounds, though, it might be helpful to make more longhand notes to figure out what those behaviors should be, especially if you don't really know what to be looking for in that context. But that's, that's a really interesting one. Yeah, I haven't really had the opportunity yet to, to conduct a study like that. And that may come back to the idea of letting that, the data drive sort of what you're looking at specifically, right? Right. Yeah, that actually might be a case where it's really much more helpful to have that so that you're not, almost you're not wasting your time looking for certain behaviors that may never occur in that situation. Right. Right. Great. Um, so how many, uh, this is a question from Marie, how many sample participants do you usually have the coders go through before uh, you sort of pass them on to the, the real, quote unquote, real participants that they'll be coding? Um, so that's another good question too. So it depends a little bit on how the coders are doing. So typically I'll have maybe about anywhere between maybe five and ten practice videos, and the length of those videos can sometimes vary a lot. 
oftentimes they may be like one to two minutes of coding because often the videos that we're recording might be 10, 15, maybe even 30 minutes or longer. And sometimes having at least a few minutes to code for each practice set can be can be really helpful. So I'd say maybe somewhere under 10 most likely, but you'll want to keep in mind if people are having a lot of difficulty with certain codes, you might have to have more examples of that particular behavior to get reliability established or to help them become more familiar with it before they code actual data. Great. Um, so again, we have a question from Dante. Um, I know you had mentioned, I think it's the FACTS um, emotional mm -hmm. expression coding. Um, yep. Are you aware of any other certifications for nonverbal coding? Um, so the one that always comes to mind is the facial action coding stuff, so the FACTS coding. Um, in terms of other certifications, let's see. I can't think of any right now off the top of my head. I'm sure there's one or two out there, but I think the facts coding, so that one again is for the, the muscle movements of the face. That one I think is the one that comes up most often in research is one that they require people to be certified. Um, almost any other type of coding scene, especially if it's going to be available based on the article, you usually don't have to be formally certified for any of those. It's really the ones where it's more like a company or business is providing the service and fact kind of falls a little bit into that category sometimes. Okay. Um, so that sort of ties into our next question from Abu. Um, how, how do you sort of make sure that the coders are coding the same thing or behavior? So outside of this certification, um, mm -hmm. how do you really ensure that your coders are looking for exactly the same thing? That's also a good question. So sometimes just directly asking them is the best option. A lot of times during those practice sessions, especially at the group meetings, what I'll typically do is we'll show a practice video. I might walk through, here's what I would code, and here are the behaviors or the marks that I, like the little signature things that mark off that behavior in this practice video that we're going through together, and then have them do one on their own in the room, and then kind of go around and talk about what they coded. And sometimes during the time where they go around and talk about what they've coded, they could then justify, well, I coded this as a frustration because their facial movements doing this, their body language is doing this, maybe either even saying something, but kind of almost asking them to point out for everyone else why they coded what they coded. And oftentimes that can help kind of establish some sense of commonality between the code or among the coders so that they all know what they're supposed to be coding. Um, you'll want to just make sure that you either as the experimenter or from the coding scheme, whatever source of information you're using for those behaviors that somewhere you have like a determine like a distinguishing line of, okay, this is definitely this behavior when you code this. And that might be you when you're leading the session, determining that or describing it for those in for those other coders. Great. Um, okay, so our next question. Um, uh, I'll just quote. This is from Christopher. Uh, I'd imagine that knowing one is being recorded would change their behavior or mannerisms. Do you have any ideas for good cover stories as to why you're recording? Ooh, so that's, let's see, so that's a big one too. Sometimes, so when we use webcams, unfortunately we have to go in the room, literally pull up the webcam software, and it shows them for a second that they're being recorded, and I think the light turns on on the webcam. So it's mm -hmm. super obvious at that point. So for those ones, we have to be like, we're going to turn on the cameras now and then turn on the cameras. In the other cases, what will happen is in the consent form, it'll say, you're going to be recorded at some point, and often they have to say, yes, I'm okay with that. But then sometimes you can just turn on the cameras, and it doesn't usually make a noise or a light won't turn on, depending on the camera that you have. But sometimes it's a little less obvious that they're going to now be recorded. Um, the only time I've come across that being an issue is sometimes if the cameras are hidden and if they didn't notice it from the get-go when they entered the room, then they might in the middle of the session kind of start asking about like, hey, those cameras, are, are they on? What's happening with them? Like, what's, why are they over there? Um, so sometimes using cameras that are just very blatantly there but quietly turning them on can be kind of a good solution for that. But you oftentimes do have to notify the participants that they're going to be recorded at some point. Um, so for our IRB, we haven't been able, and I haven't really tried it, but we haven't been able to get anything through where um, you just start recording without telling them until, say, like the end of the study that they were being recorded. Okay, that was actually, uh, I was going to interject with my question about the ethical issues involved in that, so you just answered that. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I imagine it would be more difficult if you were doing um, 
if participants weren't aware that you were recording. Yes, at that point it might be considered deception, and at least for my university's IRB, they are very, very picky about deception. So we have to be very upfront early on that they're going to be recorded at some point or during a certain task and try to be a little bit more vague about when that is so it's not quite as obvious that we're now officially recording them. Right, okay. Um, and do you know of any journals that are particularly receptive to this type of methodology, or have you come across um, any issues with reviewers or journals that you've tried to submit behavioral coding papers to? Um, that's a good question too. So unfortunately I haven't really had the opportunity to do as much manuscript writing as I probably should by now. Um, most of the journals that I've been trying to work with have been things like Emotion um, or like the journals that specifically look at nonverbal behaviors. But in terms of the articles I've come across, it seems like it really could be almost any article or sorry, almost any journal based on the primary research questions. So if, for example, you're looking at nonverbal behavior in the context of attention and mind wandering, a more cognitive journal would probably be fine, or maybe even a more nonverbal behavior related one would be fine too. It seems like there is a little bit of flexibility depending on if you're looking at the nonverbal aspect versus everything else that the study is focused on. Um, in terms of reviewer comments, I think the ones that I've come across most have been um, like training details. So a lot of the ones that I've been trying to publish have been do-it-yourself coding schemes. So talking about where the codes came from and are you sure these really do code the behaviors that you want them to and how did you train coders to ensure that they all were able to code these things. Um, so sort of adding extra details for those do-it-yourself coding schemes as opposed to one that's already established where it really might just be we use the coding scheme, here's the alpha, okay, everyone's on the same page, cool, where it doesn't really require a lot more extra detail. Right. Great. Um, and one last question, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Marie. Uh, how do you usually obtain your sample or practice videos for participants to code? Or sorry, your RAs to also code? Also a good question. <laughs> so oftentimes I'll really just go on YouTube and find what I can find. That isn't always the best option. So for example, um, this past summer I was spending way too much time trying to look for couples arguing on YouTube videos. That was a weird rabbit hole. If you're ever you have free time, try finding videos of couples arguing on YouTube. It's pretty entertaining. But finding some videos can be a little bit difficult. There are certain ones where it's more like a training video, maybe for therapy, for example, where they're like, I don't know, Bob does this and whatever the wife's name like does this kind of thing where they almost interject in between the actual argument and that's not really as helpful for the coding practice because you want it to be more realistic. When other times you can find more realistic videos um, that people have uploaded. So oftentimes I'll try to use uh, whatever might be publicly available, so things like YouTube. There are some labs where I've come across people using movies for coding, which sometimes works well too. The only downside is for movies oftentimes will change the focus of the camera. So like it's looking at their face, now it's from the other person's perspective. So it doesn't really have both people there the whole time that the scene is playing out. And that can be a little bit difficult to code people if they're flipping back and forth with sit between say like a group of people as opposed to like one individual person. Um, yeah, I'd say movies and potentially YouTube, but there are probably other options that I haven't really come across that might be even better for practice videos. Great. Okay, uh, well we are out of time. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us, Caitlin. Um, there are, there, I think there's one more question, but I would direct anyone who has any more questions for Caitlin. Uh, her email address is on the slide there. Um, and. So a big thank you uh, for helping us with this talk, and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, I'd also like to extend a special thanks to the SPISI staff and the Graduate Student Committee. In particular, thank you so much Sarah, uh, Sarah Mancall, our Policy Director, Angela Robinson, our Graduate Student uh, Committee Leader, and Cindy Lucas, our Communications Director, for conceiving, coordinating, and promoting this webinar. Um, and I just want to remind everyone to check out our social media accounts to watch this presentation again and or to learn more about future webinars uh, and other opportunities that are offered by SPICI. Um, so Sarah, I'll hand it over to you. Do you have anything to add before we close the session? Yes. Um, Katie, if you can advance to the last slide, I have a few pieces of information for people. Um, sure. Is this one the webinar? I, that's perfect. 
Um, I would like to thank you so much. I learned a lot today. Um, and Megan, the question and answer session was fascinating. I think actually it's the best Q&A session I've ever heard. Um, Please note as listed on this final slide that we are going to be sponsoring several upcoming webinars in early 2018. So far the webinars are policy focused, but we are looking for methodology focused webinars. So if you have an idea for a webinar, please submit your abstract. The link is right there on the page. You can also find a video of this recording, this webinar recording on our YouTube channel in, within the next 48 hours. And if you're interested in learning more about SPICI, our current grant opportunities, our fellowship programs, and our conference opportunities, please visit our website. And uh, I hope to see you again at one of our future webinars. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.